And so the idea that, uh, that we had was that um, today's lecture, as advertised, will focus primarily on the literary style, the authors and the audience, the purpose of the book of Joshua, as opposed to uh, making too much emphasis on first archaeology, uh, that is a very exciting topic when, when we talk about uh, this period and Jericho in particular, and two, um, literary criticism, because we can just do, uh, we decided we will do one lecture that will focus specifically on the archaeology of the book of Joshua and another one that John will do that will focus on literary criticism. I'm very sad that Elizabeth is not here because I was hoping that she was going to sing <laughs> this song for us. She was singing last week. You may talk, I'm not going to sing, sorry. You may talk about your men of Gideon. You may brag about your men of Saul. There's none like good old Joshua at the Battle of Jericho. Oh, I guess we skipped one. God knows that Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. Jericho, Jericho, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this um, spiritual, which is believed to have been composed by African-American slaves in the United States in the first half of the 19th century. And uh, of course, the lyrics are inspired in the biblical story of the Battle of Jericho that we will talk about today. However, uh, is most likely an allusion to the escape, the concept uh, of escape from slavery. And we know that there are other uh, songs in this genre that more. Uh, clearly talk about that, like, go down Moses and let my people go. So this theme of the Israelites being delivered from slavery just transformed as in the, in the 19th century uh, as a hope for liberation from slavery for African-American slaves in the US. I have a quote from Yolanda Smith from Yale Divinity School. Identifying closely with the children of Israel and the Exodus story, the slaves embraced a vision of God as delivered of the oppressed, as the deliverer of the oppressed. They viewed Jesus not only as a suffering servant and friend who understood oppression, but also as a conquering king who, through the power of his resurrection, would overcome even the most oppressive structures. The slaves believed and affirmed in song that they were valued in the eyes of God and that one day they too would experience deliverance from their bondage. And this is one of those things that really backfired because originally is believed that slave owners were uh, rather forcibly uh, converting uh, African American slaves uh, to Christianity and prohibiting them from their traditional practices in order to make them more docile. But what ended up happening is this. So what's this Jericho? Well, the Bible, of course, uh, has a lot to say about it. It calls it the city of palm trees. And it's located uh, in the modern territory of the West Bank, east, uh, sorry, west of the Jordan River. and is considered the lowest city in the world, like 846 feet below sea level. And you can see that, I'm not gonna do that again. You can see in the map, like this, this really, this, uh, it's almost like this, um, I, I hope we had our geologist here. Rift the Rift Valley. Uh, so because it's so deep, it's very close to the water table, that's why there's a lot of springs there and it's the main reason why the area is habitable because of this springs that make agriculture uh, possible. Uh, another interesting thing about Jericho is that it 
has the oldest protective wall that we know of anywhere in the world that may be older than 6800 BC. And we see archaeology shows us here more than 20 successive settlements of occupation at this site. I think uh, I want to close the door, John. Oh, OK, that's good. This is a, oh, you know what, John, could you probably, yeah, just turn off uh, the, or turn the spiral down a little bit, because it's, it's causing a lot of reflection. There you go. Uh, one of the really, uh, the, the things that first uh, got me interested in talking about uh, Jericho is the fact that it's one of the oldest uh, sites where we, in the world where we see permanent year-round human occupation and so we have found here permanent settlements that go back to 9000 BC and even earlier and there's a lot of archaeology happening right now and one of the interesting thing about the people who occupied this site that we call the Natufians, Natufian culture is that even without agriculture and without pottery, they were able to inhabit this site year round and that's why they started building permanent structures at this site um, that we call Tel Es Sultan. And so and that's, that's helping us reshape our thinking of how the development of uh, civilization, at least in this part of the world, uh, really took place. So it's not that people only uh, once after people had agriculture they started settling. Uh, Shaheen has a comment. Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up with that and it's really, if we look just on the map, it's really close to like the, Ana like the Turkey Anatolia region, which yes. is where um, agriculture and settlement first started. So going back to about 11,000 BC, where they find that pre-agriculture, people were harvesting wild icorn wheat right. and using that, and that's what helped them settle. And so it might, it's, it's very close, it's close enough that the, the wheat could have just also been present. Yeah, and it's, it's actually, so that, that's one map. There's other researchers that even extend this Natufian circle you know, further north into what it's modern day Turkey. Uh, but yeah, they had all sorts of things that we didn't expect in, in this period, in, including now uh, there's one of these latest publications that they had, uh, they were making bread and probably beer. So all the way back. And now when we talk about this side, we always like, well, why always so much emphasis in this tiny little portion of land, always you know, looking at Israel, Palestine. Um, and so there's other, of course, very, very interesting sites. Uh, I know I'm not going to pronounce it properly, Chatal Hoyuk. Yeah? Um, now, this site is a lot more recent. So the oldest layers of occupation uh, uh, go back at, as far as 7500 BCE. And it wasn't occupied for more than 1,800 years, as far as, I, uh, as far as we can tell. The really uh, interesting thing about this place is the size. It's believed that up to 10,000 people were living there permanently, whereas Jericho, uh, as we will see later, is a very tiny place. So it's probably just a few hundred people that were living there on the tell itself, and of course then in surrounding villages. Another very interesting site also in modern day Turkey that uh, is giving us a lot to think about when we think of, of the Neolithic Revolution is Gübekli Tepe. Gübekli Tepe. I'm not going to say it right, but you can ask Urgen if you have any questions. Uh, so this site is probably dates as far back as Jericho. However, is, there's no signs of permanent 
settlement in this area. And so, of course, archaeologists uh, are um, coming up with explanations about what the purpose of building all these uh, just massive uh, structures in, on this site may have been. And so far, what we can, the, the best guess is that it's a place of congregation that may have ritual uh, significance. Um, however, once again, this was abandoned in the Stone Age, was never reoccupied until classical times. Uh, and as far as we can tell, no one really lived there. So why Jericho? How does Jericho compare to other cities, other very old cities that we more often talk about? Uh, for example, the cities of Mesopotamia, the cities of Egypt. Um, well, we do have for example, Byblos and Damascus that are very, very old. The oldest settlements, of course, are not as big as the later cities um, of historic times, but you know, Damascus that may date as far back as 63 uh, BC, a little bit um, earlier, depending on what you consider Damascus to be. Byblos, very, very old city, 8800 BCE, but then these other cities in Egypt and Mesopotamia are a lot more recent, thousands of years more recent. Even um, this city that is, uh, there's a lot of um, interest in the city, Ebla, that you see there in what it's uh, modern day Syria. Ebla appears to be uh, the center of a very ancient civilization that was native to this part of the world, northeast uh, Syria. Unfortunately, excavations at Ebla have stopped in 2011 for uh, the events that are happening there right now. And it's very sad because it's, it's very likely to get uh, damaged. So, however, Jericho remains older than all these other sites. Just to compare, for example, when we uh, look into the archaeology of Israel, we get the earliest um, records that go back as far back as maybe 4500, maybe 3500 BC, thousands of years after Jericho. And really, the main archaeological uh, remains uh, come uh, from this mount that we call the city of David that is very, very, very small and it only goes back up to the 17th, uh, 17th century BC. Of course, it's a lot more complicated to do archaeology in Jerusalem because unlike Jericho where the tell has been abandoned, in Jerusalem most likely you have a historic church, mosque, synagogue that has built on top of the site. And now I invite you to take a few minutes to get familiar with the story of Joshua as we have it in the Bible. So from the beginning, let's see where we start here. So the book of Joshua opens with this God's commission to Joshua. So God says, my servant Moses is dead, now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all these, uh, all these people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. Then uh, we learn that there's spies that are sent to Jericho to get help from a prostitute that has a house that is just on the wall itself, apparently has a window that looking outside the wall, and she promises to help uh, the Israelites in exchange for her life and the life of her family. And uh, the spies go back to the camp and they report that the people of Jericho are afraid. They understand that Yahweh, that God himself, is leading the army. And I want, I want to bring your attention now to the literary style here. Uh, I call the lecture from Rubble to Epic, 
So think of this, especially this uh, few slides that follow, as epic literature. Yahweh to Joshua, you shall march around a city, all the warriors circling the city once, thus you shall do for six days, with seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, the priests blowing the trumpets. When they make a long blast with the ram's horn, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and all the people shall church straight ahead. Pretty clear commandments, pretty clear what the instructions are. And Joshua now goes and tells the people exactly the same, so in exactly the same, mostly in the same uh, words, we have this commandment from Yahweh. Now Joshua telling it, communicating it to the people. It happens yet another time. Now the people actually do as they are told, and the authors were made sure that we actually read it. And yet, in case you didn't get it, you read it once again. At the end of all that, the authors were kind enough not to repeat it the six times that they mentioned this happens. Um, and in fact, if you read ancient epic, like for example, the book of Gilgamesh, you'll see that each repetition is actually written in the book and you have to read it. So here, at least, it's only four times that we have to read the same. And finally, uh, we hear that on the second day, they march around the city once and then return to the camp. On, uh, I think that should say the seventh day. They march around the city once and then they return to the camp. They did, oh no, they did this for six days. So yeah, that's right, second day. On the seventh day, of course, we have the climax of this story. And we hear that um, on the seventh day, they rose early at dawn and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout. So, the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpets, they raised the great shout, and the wall fell down flat. So the people charged straight ahead into the city and captured it. Then they devoted to destruction by the edge of the sword all in the city, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys. So nothing remains because God is claiming all the spoils. Now, something that gives us an idea that at the time that people were writing this story, the tell that you see here was already abandoned, is the curse of Joshua. Curse before Yahweh be anyone who tries to rebuild the city of Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn, he shall lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest, he shall set up its gates. So it gives us an idea that most likely it was still abandoned by the time that people were writing and reading this story. And you can see how tiny that tail is. The, the houses right next to it are tiny as well, but the tail is only like something like there's a ditch around it that is only like 600 meters long. So what happens after this, the Jericho, the Battle of Jericho, which is the climax of the, the story of Joshua, uh, we learn that there's this uh, person by the name of Achan who takes loot that belongs to Yahweh. So instead of 
putting everyone to the sword and burning everything, he decides to take some gold, some, some goodies to him, and he buries them. And what's the consequence of this violation of the commandment? Uh, the next campaign that they uh, go to against the city of Ai fails when Ahan confesses the people bring Ahan and his family together, they stone them to death, next time they go to Ai, they win, the Israelites win. So we begin to see here this theology that is emerging in what we call the Deuteronomic, uh, Deuteronomic uh, reform that we will talk more about uh, later on. There's a lot of campaigns against other cities that are mentioned uh, in Joshua. Uh, some cities that we know of, that some cities that are, have been found in the, in, the, in the archaeological records, some cities that we don't really know where they are, whether they are purely mythical, if they ever existed. Um, we learn about the, uh, this event, the day the sun stood still. Uh, the people of Gibeon first deceive uh, Joshua in order to, you know, because they were just like the people of Jericho, they were afraid, and so they pretend to be someone else. They get into the camp, they turns out, turns out they're not who they said they are. They promise, please don't kill us and all our families. Joshua said, all right, we're not going to kill you and all your families, but you're going to become our slaves. Um, and just after this event, uh, when they go to the city of Gibeon, Joshua commands the sun and the moon, these uh, heavenly objects that in ancient times were also considered heavenly entities, heavenly beings, in other words, <coughs> divinities, to stand still, and they did. The people of Israel continue their conquest of the land of Canaan, and I want to bring your attention, I don't know if the, the color is intentional here, of just the graphic description of the destruction that is taking place. Israel took all the loot and livestock from these cities, but they put everyone to death until they were all destroyed. Not, all, not one person survived. And it wasn't apparently just by accident. Yahweh himself was behind the stubbornness of the people who kept fighting till the end, till the last uh, person. Yahweh made their enemies stubborn enough to continue fighting against Israel so that he could claim them all for destruction without mercy as Yahweh had commanded Moses. We usually don't read those passages a lot during church on Sundays here, do we? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's always interesting, you know, because we sometimes do read Old Testament, not so much the book of Joshua, but sometimes we do, but we deliberately skip these bloody scenes. However, and now back to green, immediately after all this destruction and claiming every life and everyone for Yahweh, we learn that, well, maybe not really. Uh, perhaps another author is telling us now that no land there's land yet to be conquered and so the land that is left includes all the districts that belong to the Philistines and Geshur which is in the Golan Heights uh, the division of the land among the tribes continues and this is like a very very exhausted description of what belongs to each tribe and you know this this one sentence here the eastern border is the Dead Sea as far north as the mouth of the Jordan River continue there to the little rock there that tree there that other stream and it goes on and on and on pages and pages chapter after chapter a very legalistic uh, a very legalistic document explaining what part of the land belongs to which 
tribe. And lastly, turns out that not all the Canaanites, after all, were killed. In the previous lecture, we compared side by side Joshua with the book of Joshua, which is in the Bible, uh, the book that follows the book of Joshua. And we see how the accounts of Joshua and Judges usually are conflicting. In Joshua, there's a, uh, a lot more of a, the, the conquest of the land is not so much a conquest, but it's, it's like a very uh, conflicted migration into the land and the people are living there and everyone's living together, sometimes fighting, some tribes sometimes help each other, sometimes not. It's not a, such a clear picture like the one we get in Joshua. However, even within Joshua, in the last chapters, we learn that in fact, they did not force out the Canaanites who, li who live in Gezer. So the Canaanites still live in Ephraim today, but they are required to do forced labor. And even more interesting, uh, Joseph's descendants, whose uh, land allotment is in the north, they're kind of sandwiched together into all the other tribes. And they don't have a lot of land, apparently. So they complain to Joshua. The mountains are not enough for us either. Besides all the Canaanites living in the valley in Beth uh, She'an and its villages are in the valley of Jezreel and have chariots made of iron. So these people are, apparently, even though first we claim that we killed everyone and we claimed everyone for Yahweh, apparently they're still there and they're not only that, they're powerful. They have chariots of iron. And the book closes with a reminder to follow Moses' teachings, the death of Joshua and Eliezer, who is Aaron's son, Eliezer the priest. Joshua is uh, buried in the region, uh, in the northern uh, part of the land of Canaan, what becomes the kingdom of Israel, Samaria, as opposed to Judah. The book of Judges starts right after this scene uh, telling us that Israel was unable to defeat the Canaanites once again. So apparently there's still a lot of Canaanites running around in, in this region. In that text you just said, okay, where does that come from? That's a Septuagint. Mm -hmm. This? Mm -hmm. Septuagint. The, John can explain. It's the, it's the Greek version of the book of Joshua. So it's the, um, it's a, so it's an ancient Egyptian, but in Greek, you know. It's in Greek, and it's one of the oldest copies that we have of the Hebrew Bible together with uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's in Greek. So I was suggesting you keep in mind the fact that this lit the literary style of the book of Joshua is epic poetry. Is not necessarily poetry in the case of Joshua, but it, it has the elements of the poetry of an epic, which is a long narrative, but in, by definition is, is poetry that tells the story. So Joshua is, for the most part, prose. Uh, something that uh, is very common in, in the themes of epics is that we're talking about a time that is before a time that we can remember, or a, a time before anyone we know. We, we know a few generations back, and that's it. This happened uh, way back. The actors of the epic are extraordinary humans or extraordinary divinities, and the theme usually circles around uh, 
identity construction, not always, but it's a very common theme of epic poetry. Uh, this is, comes from the uh, oral tradition, so it was transmitted orally initially using mnemonic techniques like metric, music, epithets, these little uh, descriptive phrases that we attach to the name of great people, to the name of God, goddesses. There's repetition that is like a refrain of a song. You just repeat and repeat and repeat and you remember it. Uh, there's a statement of the theme, like it happens at the beginning of Joshua. The heroic figure uh, often uh, faces great challenges, but they receive divine assistance. The divine, the gods, or God intervene to help our hero. There are things like formal speeches and catalogs, so lists of objects, places, peoples. And some examples that I'm sure most of you know are, of course, the epic of Gilgamesh, that is the oldest epic that we know of, that we have. Uh, that comes from Sumeria and from close to Sumeria, from Babylonia, we have the Enuma Elish, that is a little uh, more recent, but still quite old, that tells the story of the, of the god Marduk uh, rising to power in the Pantheon. I'm sure everyone heard about the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Roman Aeneid. What other epics can you think of Shaheen knows an epic? Oh, as many as you want. <laughs> um, the, there's the Mahabharat and the Ramayana as well, which are probably around the same time as the Iliad. Oh. Or maybe a little younger than that. Mm -hmm. there's the Divine Comedy. The Divine Comedy, yeah. Anyone else? The Canterbury Tales. The Canterbury Tales. <coughs> and there was one there. Paolo? Uh, Beowulf. Beowulf. Rudy? Uh, you were going to say Beowulf. And Valerie? Icelandic sagas. The Icelandic sagas. Oh, yeah. So there. King uh, the King Arthur sagas, yeah, right? So, yeah, there's. it's a very, very common... Uh, literary form around the world. And it's interesting because many times uh, some scholars will claim there's no epic poetry in Israel. And so based on that assumption, we say, all right, we just close the chapter and we don't look at any book of the Bible as having the same literary purpose, style, than these books may have. Of course, you're not gonna leave this room without hearing a little bit about Ugarit, uh, because this ancient city that we discussed in a previous lecture is a city that uh, is one of these Canaanite cities that we know of, and we have their literature, and uh, they spoke a language that is very related to ancient Hebrew. In fact, uh, what their, their script, Phoenician script, uh, that were developing at the time was also the same script that the first books, original books of the Bible were uh, it, the script uh, in which they were written. Very related people, and also their material culture is similar to that of Israel and even some of the ideas of conceptualizing the divine, the relationship between humans and the divine that the Ugaritic people had, we see later on in Israel. So this is from the library that we found in Ugarit uh, that dates to the 12th century uh, BCE, at the time of the Bronze Age collapse that we'll talk about later. We have, for example, uh, the epic of Kirta, sometimes Keret, uh, who the challenge for him, because he's a king, he needs an heir, and that seems to be an ongoing issue for kings. He, luckily, he's 
favored by L, so he's got just like a good epic poem would, would have, all sorts of epithets, like the epithets. The, the lad of L, for example, is one of his epithets. So he's the son of L in the story. And he doesn't have a very good relationship with El's wife, the goddess Asherah. So El and Asherah, remember, are the supreme gods of uh, the Ugaritic uh, pantheon, the creator god and the mother goddess. But El tells uh, Kirta that he, El, will grant uh, the city of Uden, where he's going to find the Canaanite Helen of Troy, uh, and he's going to capture her, and she's going to give him many sons. And here's how it goes. Stop for a day, and a second, a third, then a fourth day, a fifth, then a sixth day. Don't shoot your arrows into the city, your sling stones into the fortress. Then by sunset on the seventh, King Pabil of Uden will be unable to sleep and hear all the miraculous things happen where, you know, in the seventh day the city is uh, now open for uh, Kirta to enter with his army. And speaking about armies, there's this word that appears a lot in the Bible together with the name of Yahweh, the name of God, is the word Sabaot, Shabaot. Sabaot, I guess. How is it pronounced? Tsevaot. 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 Sometimes it's Yahweh Tsevaot, Yahweh Elohe Tsevaot, Adonai Yahweh Tsevaot. And it really literally means the God or the Lord of armies, of the armies. And for those of you who know that Handel's Messiah, when we sing Handel's Messiah, there's this part where we talk and we praise the Lord of hosts, and that's just the King James translation of uh, Tsebaot, Lord of Armies. So next time you sing the Messiah, remember that. And uh, this is related to something that appears a lot in the Ugaridi uh, literature, uh, this idea of the armies of heaven, sometimes assembly of the gods. So there's a little bit of a connection there with this ancient religious culture of the Canaans. The idea that God is the one who leads the armies. Because the theme of the warrior God is another thing that is very common in all these uh, ancient uh, epic poems. A God that is a God that wages war against the enemies. Here in the Canaanite pantheon, the warrior God is not El. It's this is polytheistic system, so each God serves a different purpose. Baal is the warrior God, the, war, uh, the God of the storm, the God of the rain, the God of war. And uh, from the Baal cycle, he crossed from town to town, he toured from village to village, Baal captured 66 cities, 77 towns, Baal sacked 80, Baal sacked 90. So how many cities captured Baal? How many cities did he sack? 60, 80, and this is, again, that's a very particular kind of literary uh, resource that people in this part of the world use that appears a lot in the Bible. And uh, it's one of the things that sometimes leads to confusion in the Bible. Like um, I can think of that uh, um, the Matthew with uh, donkey and the cold. Yeah, because how, how does that go, John? It's Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and Matthew gets confused because he's reading the Old Testament prophecies about him writing on the colt, the, the child of a donkey or whatever, right. and so he has it on both, even though it's just poetic repetition in the Old it's Testament poetic repetition that, that misunderstands it. That is present in this ancient, it's, it's more ancient uh, literature from Ugarit. It's interesting that it's 
just a stupid comment, but Fat, no, that's <laughs> no comment. It's interesting stupid. that the number adds up to three hundred and it's divisible by three, which is rep can be representative of the Holy Trinity. <laughs> wow, you made your mass? Wow. <laughs> I didn't. Sixty-six, seventy-seven, eighty. Oh. Well, but you know what? But it's uh, it probably is supposed to be three hundred because the sixty-six is is just poetic. In epic poetry, we often see uh, what we call the origin myths, uh, and there's different kinds of origin myths, or we can group them in different kinds. For example, the ethnogenesis, uh, the idea of identity formation, and specifically, where do we come from? And there's really only two ways of answering that question. We either come from here, and for the most part, Egyptians and Greeks seem to understand themselves as coming from there, being native. But the Romans, for example, think that they come from Troy, the Inca in South America, they think that they come from a different valley and they entered the valley of Cusco where their, the capital of their empire is and they killed everyone. So either way, you're from here, you understand to be from the land or you understand to be from somewhere else but now you live here. Origin myths also explain why things are the way they are. Why do we do this ritual? Why do we have this tradition? Why is this tell that we see here in the Valley of Jericho abandoned? Why is there a rock or like this rock formation or so on and so forth? What, what's the, who were the people that um, lived in this city that is now in ruins? You explain that with these stories and uh, in the book of Joshua, and I'm not, I'm not going to read everything, uh, one of the things that tells you when you find one of these etiologies is when the book, when after a story that is very interesting, you read things like, and these stones are still there today. Another story, and then, well, and the name is still, uh, the name is still has, uh, is that right? Oh, yeah, the place is Gilgal. The name it still has today. And so names of places, of uh, things, it's still, the city is still in ruins today. So there's a lot of that in the book of Joshua. These are only just a few, because otherwise I have to talk all night about it. But you'll, I invite you to grab the book. And usually it's very easy to find, because they're all at the end of each chapter. Because I know that you might be thinking about the archaeology. We'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, there might be a lot of questions. Uh, so I'm, this is just scratching the surface uh, of the archaeology. What we know of Jericho. What can, uh, can archaeology tell us about this site and perhaps about this battle that we read about uh, in the book of Joshua, and also these campaigns that happened in other cities. So we started with this Iron Age, very, very old settlement of the Natufian culture, and it's continuously inhabited, more or less. Sometimes there's a, maybe a couple centuries where the site is abandoned and gets uh, occupied again. Um, the, period that interests us is the period of the Bronze Age, specifically the Middle Bronze Age. Um, and this is where archaeology tell us this tell at Jericho was at its greatest extent. So it has the, the largest structures come from this period. Remember that the Bronze Age is divided by the, the kingdoms of Egypt. However, this, um, yeah, I think that's a typo. It is, 
this site, archaeology, ar archaeologists since the 1970s have um, argued that the site was not destroyed at the time that the Bible tells us Joshua would have been there, but it was destroyed earlier. It was probably destroyed some two centuries earlier at the end of uh, the Middle Bronze Age. Because the book of Joshua, we believe, is uh, the, you know, the story in the Bible should have taken place based on what we read in the story of Exodus sometime between the 14th and 12th century BCE. And this period coincides with what we call the Late Bronze Age Collapse, which more or less within a few decades, the cities and uh, city-states of uh, Mycenae uh, and mainland Greece, the Hittite Empire, and most of the cities of Canaan and even some cities in uh, farther inland uh, just fell. And uh, here's because of the Egyptian records, uh, we talk about the Sea Peoples entering in the, this eastern part of the Mediterranean and there's a lot of debate about who these Sea peoples were, for our purposes, one of the things that we saw in a previous, uh, we talked about in the previous lecture is uh, this record, uh, the Merneptah Stila that we see here, that dates from uh, 12, I think 1207, 1208 BCE, um, that one of the things that the Stila says, among other uh, report of Pharaoh Merneptah conquering all its uh, all these uh, invading armies that are part of this Sea People's invasion. Merneptah reports that in the land of Cana, uh, he destroyed a number of cities, and the million-dollar line is the one that archaeologists say or um, linguists say translate as Israel is laid waste and his seed is not. So we'll talk about what that means in the previous lecture or maybe we'll, we'll do it at the end because uh, there's also debate on whether or not that word is translated, that is translated as Israel could simply be translated as nomad, uh, nomads. And at this time, then, that Joshua is just fighting all uh, these Canaanites, is waging all these uh, campaigns against all these cities of Canaan, uh, we get no mention at all of Egypt. But at, in this time period, we do have Egyptian records that tell us that, in fact, Egypt was busily waging wars in this uh, land that we call Canaan. And specifically, we have another document, in addition to the Merneptah Stila, that, is, that tells us about uh, the Battle of Tiahi, that is one of the names for southern Canaan, between Ramesses III and, once again, these Sea Peoples. And this is considered as the decline, at the beginning of the decline of Egyptian influence in Canaan. So, the problem with the narrative, when people want to make it a historical narrative, is first of all, this is an Egyptian, Egyptian is part of the Egyptian sphere of influence, and Egypt was busily um, fighting wars in this region at the time that Joshua supposedly, if, if we read the Bible, if we follow the, the timeline of the Bible, should have been there. After all these events, the Bronze Age collapse, the tell at Jericho remains unoccupied until the 10th or 9th century, and archaeologists have found a considerable uh, sized town that dates to the 7th century BC, that's before 
uh, the conquest by the Babylonian armies. And that's when this tell gets destroyed. And luckily for archaeologists today, the site was never uh, reoccupied. Any questions up to this moment? Robert has a question. From a mineral point of view, I guess maybe there was an outcropping just below the surface of a lot of copper, and they discovered that, so I could see them, the Bronze Age, uh, flourishing because of them finding the minerals, and Egypt continually going up there to raid the copper mm -hmm. and get back there, is my guess. That's one of the... Uh, interesting things about like modern excavations that have found this uh, large copper mine uh, nearby. I don't know if it's, uh, is it near Jericho or is it near um, uh, Tel Hazor? I'm not sure it's Jericho, but it's, there's, uh, yeah, there's uh, evidence of uh, large scale mining happening in some of these cities that the Book of Joshua mentions. So who is Hobbes? Hobbes? Tim knows. Thomas Hobbes. Very funny to see Calvin and Hobbes up there. And they were the first ones, like in the 1500s, that were beginning to challenge this assumption that dates, as far as we know, uh, to the the authors of the Talmud, uh, that the text was composed by Joshua himself. So that only appears in, in this period in the, in the this is the uh, second or third century AD. So in ancient times, in, uh, in BC times, this association of the book of Joshua with Joshua as author, as far as we know, did not exist. So very early on, uh, in, uh, modern in the early modern times, uh, there's a lot of thinkers that started rejecting that um, <clears throat> authorship claim. And in modern times, with uh, the techniques of literary criticism that we talked about and uh, John talks about um, in other lectures, um, we begin uh, to see this as part of what we call the Deuteronomistic history that goes uh, from the book of Deuteronomy in the Bible all the way up to the books of Kings and probably even at least part of the book of Jeremiah. John predated uh, Hobbes predated John Locke, who was a utilitarian philosopher for people online. How are we doing online? Are people okay? Yeah, I'm watching them. Okay. Because we've been having a lot of technical difficulties with the audio lately. So please let us know. <coughs> now, this is a little confusing, and I'm sure, especially if you're sitting at the back, you might not be able to see a lot, but I'm going to try to get close to this without causing too much feedback. This here and this brown color there, this is where we locate this Bronze Age collapse when all these cities of Canaan were suddenly, not all, but most of these cities are suddenly either destroyed or uh, weakened by these newcomers that the Egyptians call the Sea Peoples. One of these Sea Peoples are the Philistines that settle in the coast of southern Canaan. We move on and this Deuteronomic, you know, after this period of the perhaps legendary united monarchy under Saul, David, and Solomon, we move into what we start to consider the historical period when we do have historical records that are coming from the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. 
And we have, for example, with uh, the evidence of very early kings of the northern kingdom of Israel, King Omri, King Ahab. Uh, however, Assyria destroys the northern kingdom in 720 BCE. It is believed that uh, the elites of the northern kingdom were exiled to uh, Assyria, to cities like Ashur, Nineveh, and that's the origin of this uh, story of the lost tribes. They're, they lost their identity as a people once they were in uh, Assyria. However, we believe that some exiles moved into the southern kingdom of Judah, and if you look at the map, the capitals are really close to each other. They settled in Judah, bringing their stories. At the end of this kingdom of Judah period, we have um, King, where's King Josiah, that is the one, and during his reign starts this process that we call the Deuteronomic reform. We'll talk more about that. Jerusalem falls. Soon after, Josiah and this religious reform that was taking place during his reign, the kingdom falls back into paganism. Uh, the city falls to the Babylonians. The elites are exiled to Babylon. When the Persians conquer Babylon, and here's the Persian period, the Persians allow the exiles in Babylon to return. And so we have this thing that we call the decree of Cyrus. That is, however, most likely simply Cyrus, a policy of allowing people to return and rebuild their cultic sites if they want, as opposed to a mass migration like, of people going back uh, to Israel. So this return of the exiles, although we often like to see it as one point in history, happened over time, and not everyone returned also. Uh, there are some estimates that say that, uh, well, the Bible claim that more people returned to Israel than the people that were living in Israel total at the time uh, during the Persian period. So we'll, we'll mention that later. To simplify this map, Here's where we start seeing uh, all these different authors of Joshua. So we start, as far as we can tell, Joshua starts being composed during the period of the kingdom of Judah. And there are later additions and revisions that happen during the exile, but some of the uh, most recent arguments from scholars have been that the book continued to be edited and into uh, the Persian period around 400 BC, which is the time where we date uh, the book of Ezra. And why all this paying attention to the timeline here? Because I want you to get a sense of how the circumstances were changing over time. From the time that we start collecting all these stories about Joshua into a book to the time that the book takes the form that we recognize today, a lot of things happen in between. So we have to not only be aware of the different authors, but also the different audiences. Chapters 1 to 13, which are the chapters that we've uh, read here, uh, perhaps uh, are related to what literary criticism calls the J source, the Yahwist source, that is believed to be literature that was uh, created for the court of the kings of Judah in this period. 
of Judah's height. The character of Joshua is, however, a northern hero. And proof of that is that he gets buried in the north at the end of the book of Joshua. He, he has his assembly at Shechem, not at Jerusalem. And his, the land that he inherits is in the north, not in the south. So back to this period. So that's when, at the beginning of this Judas height blue box that we have there, that's when we start compiling the book. It's only towards the end, only towards the end of that period that with King Josiah, the book starts to take, mo for the most part, uh, the shape that it has today. And the interesting thing is that the situation had changed considerably because Josiah had a very, very different purpose. What we have here at the beginning during the, king, the, kings of, the early kings of Judah is this idea that we are going to claim the land that is around us. The kingdom of the north was destroyed. However, that land is also ours. Whereas Josiah is interested in something completely different. He's got a theological proposition that there should be one city, one king, and one God. And this is where this development of Israelite monotheism really starts happening. It's during Josiah and his Deuteronomic reform. So it's a different purpose that we assign here to the same book. However, soon after Josiah, Josiah, everyone, or at least not everyone, the elites are exiled. And when they start returning to the land slowly, this book is telling the exiles, it's addressing a very different circumstance. The writers and the audience are in a completely different circumstance from this and this. Because now they return not to a kingdom of Judah, but to a Persian province, Yehud Medinata. So there's no longer a king, a Davidic king. Now we have a governor that was appointed by the Persian uh, king of kings and a priest. The returnees are encouraged in the pages of the book of Joshua to fear not because this is our land. So reject, rejecting in, uh, in the way those who remained in the land as mixed and impure. And remember, it's only perhaps max 25% of the population, but most likely less, was exiled to Babylon. For the most part, people stayed. And we even have, in the archaeological record, a lot of smaller settlements across Judah that show no sign of destruction and that are continuously inhabited in this exilic period. So most people stay there, but now we see them as different. They're, they have mixed with the people of, with other people, and most, uh, worst of all, they have reverted, quote unquote, into paganism, into the practices of the older religion of the land. Ezra claims that 40,000 exiles return, which matches the number of Joshua's troops who cross the Jordan to fight Jericho. The leadership model of Joshua and Eliezer, uh, the priest, is echoed in Yehud's uh, priest and governor, Ezra and Nehemiah. So now the slowly during the Persian period, and the Persian were trying different things, because uh, it's always, in ancient times, it was never easy to rule 
this part of the world. The Persians try different things. Eventually, the governor's role just becomes uh, restricted to keeping order in the land and ensuring the tribute was paid. And there's an increasingly authority of the priests. And it's in this period that for the first time, the figure of the high priest of the Temple of Jerusalem is, um, it appears. So it becomes a de facto theocracy within the Persian Empire. So to recap, kings of Judah that are trying to make claim to the land of Israel, King Josiah that has in mind a religious reform because he wants to see worship, a, a divine and human authority coming from one city under one king and under one God. And later we have this other purpose for a different audience who are finding inspiration in these stories of the conquest of the land, of the land that had been promised to them as now they entered. But of course, there were not 40,000 of them, never. So imagine yourself crossing the Jordan River with this idea in mind of 40,000 troops crossing the river with the army of God. And I will argue that the book even continues to resonate with modern audiences. And it's not only our uh, modern concern uh, with historicity, uh, which for sure it's, uh, it's out there, but we saw at the beginning of this presentation that it was read in the 19th century as liberation, uh, as giving hope to the oppressed peoples for a, the possibility of liberation. And many claim that was instrumental in the establishment of the modern kingdom of Israel, and it was read as a national myth during this period. However, you know, and that, because of that, it's highly criticized uh, the use of the book of Joshua in the modern day Israel especially. But even some of these critics are arguing that even within the book of Joshua, we see an underlying history as a post-national model. This conflicting, contradicting accounts of separation, of cleansing of the land, as opposed to the picture that we get towards the end where in fact, it turns out no, we're all living together, continues to be an you know, ongoing debate, especially in Israel, but I will argue Everywhere, the wall continues to be a symbol of a great obstacle that can be overcome by faith. And we got to the end. So thank you very much. Uh, Marvin has a question. Yeah. How do, how do Christians reconcile their idea of the loving Jesus and so on with this bloodthirsty Yahweh it's depicted in uh, here. Well, that's why I was saying that uh, often we don't read that in uh, Sunday mornings. Those lines are skipped, and it's not only uh, in the book of Joshua, but there's also a lot of that in other books, especially the so that we do read the Psalms a lot. It's part of the lectionary. Uh, and yet, when you see the suggested readings, it's going to say Psalm 150, uh, verses 1 to 3, and then 10 and 11. And you skip the middle part. And when you go and read the middle part, sometimes it's not the nice face of Yahweh. 
that we like to see. So how do we reconcile it? Well, again, uh, for us, for example, in this church, yeah, it's, that's, that's a struggle, right? That's, this is how the people at the time understood the divine. The role of God is to help you. God promised the land in which you were going to live, and he's going to help you make sure that you get it if you do as God commands. Whereas now we don't think about a God in those terms anymore. Uh, Shaheen. Yeah, um, I was wondering if we could go back to the slide that had the image of Baal on it. Yes. Yeah, that's the one. So I had a point to make about this slide. And I mean, given that we know the region was under Egyptian influence for a good few hundred years. Mm -hmm. I don't know why no one says that's not Baal. That's a very classical pharaonic pose. Yeah. That is a pharaoh with the white crown of Upper Egypt, and the pose you can clearly see where the kilt was around his middle. Oh yeah. Um, yeah and yeah, yeah. the pose he is in is the classical smiting pose of the pharaoh. So I don't know why they keep saying it's Baal. I think they say it's Baal because they found it. In, in that region. However, Baal was from very early on associated with uh, Set in, in Egypt. So it's, Baal is the, the, the rival of Osiris <coughs> for all practical purposes. Um, but there's, a, of course, there's a lot of cross pollination between Egypt and Canaan. And in fact, uh, even in, into um, the um, historic period, like the people of uh, Phoenicia continue to uh, have like Egyptian fashions. There's a lot of uh, Egyptian style uh, burials with sarcophagi and things like that, very elaborate, just like in Egypt, that we find even in places like, uh, like Carthage, for example. So the cultures were very much influencing each other. And you know, we have also goddesses like Anat, who is the daughter of El, the huntress, that ends up being, uh, when the Israelites go to uh, Elephantini, Anat becomes Yahweh's wife, because Anat was already a goddess in Egypt. The e Egyptians absorb Anat, so there's I think she was one of the wives of Osiris in some of the myths. I think it was uh, Catherine first. Oh. Um, although afterwards you, you did mention that not all of the Canaanites were destroyed, I was curious about uh, poor Rahab, the prostitute spy was promised uh, sanctuary oh. along with her family. Yes. Do we have any information about her? Well, she did. Uh, the, the book says that Joshua did keep his promise and that she and her family uh, were allowed to live and they moved to some city. I don't know which city. And it's one of those stories that say, and, you know, and they still live there or something like that. So it's, it's one of those. Um, but that idea that um, someone has to help you so there's got to be, uh, you send spies, and then someone of the local population betrays the city. That also appears uh, later on in Joshua again. So that's, a, that's one of these things that we see in the Bible, all these duplets. Uh, that the same good story, apparently, is too good to tell it only once. And the second, and Joshua is not a prostitute, and Joshua is something else. I don't remember what it was in Joshua. But. I think it's Valerie and, and then Tim. Oh, I thought, OK, so Tim here. It's over here. Thank you, Arjun. Uh, just about the question. It's very, yeah, just it's quiet. That's the that's a one that doesn't work very well today. Uh, the question about reconciling what the, the book says to actual life, um, just uh, with regards to like the Italian Renaissance, since I was in Italy, um, uh -huh. Saint Augustine's comment on that was that the Bible 
was not meant to tell you how to live life on earth, but how to reach salvation in heaven. So to recognize that storytellers and actual humans wrote a book, yeah. where the facts might be fiction kind of thing. It wasn't meant to be a guide on how you should live kind of thing. So skipping stories kind of makes sense. And Augustine, uh, Augustine, right? Saint Augustine. Saint, yeah, which goes back to yeah. uh, fourth century AD. So that's very early on. Uh, and, and yet, uh, there's some, so when, uh, for the first time, people started to question, uh, and this is something that I'm hoping to talk about more when we talk about specifically the archaeology of behind this book. Because uh, unlike, unlike Exodus, there are things that we can say about it. Because Exodus is, archaeology can't tell us much about a migration. People migrating don't leave tracks behind most times. But here we have sites, we have cities, even cities that are destroyed at the time that supposedly the Bible tells us these events happened. And yet um, when specifically the, the idea, um, the archaeological results uh, began to tell us, no, this is not history. And this was in the 70s, and it was very problematic, and uh, especially because it was a woman archaeologist also who was making this claim. Uh, people started saying, well, we have to, like similar to Augustine, like, okay, this is not history, so we have to see what the story is telling us about God. That was one of the uh, claims that archaeologists were saying that this, this is not debunking the Bible. This is interpreting the text in a different way, not as history, but it doesn't mean that it, does, it has no value anymore because it's not history. Yeah, just, uh, because, just because you hit on a slide about the sun and the moon standing still, it was the argument uh, for Galileo's switch to the heliocentric version as opposed to the Ptolemaic mm -hmm. version of the solar system where uh, the arguments for Galileo's position was that the Bible's not supposed to tell you how to live life and it's not supposed to argue the facts about the Bible, that the earth could revolve around yeah. the sun and the Bible could still be right. We just had a lecture about that that you can watch online because yeah that's it's a lot more complicated than that actually we learned with, with John but, but yeah, that was one of the arguments for sure. Thank you. I don't know your name. Chris. Chris. Yeah, I just uh, was wondering about El. He was the warrior god from Canaan, was he? Oh, where is he? El. El or Baal? El. El is in the Canaanite religion oh. is a creator, is a father, is the compassionate, is the protector. He's always a good God. Um, he has uh, other attributes that I can't talk about because this is a church, but um, you, you can imagine. <laughs> and and uh, Asherah is... The, the concert, and she is one of her epithets is mother of the, the mother of the gods, and the lady. The one of the ones that is very interesting is that she's the lady of the sea, the lady that uh, kind of hovers over the sea. So this this being church right here, this is all part of the mythology or just of the epic or whatever. Well, the epic. If we consider Joshua epic literature, uh, then this is happening, this is being composed uh, much later. This, uh, the, um, the text that we get in this site, uh, Ugarit, these texts come from the 12th century BCE, 1200 BCE. And we know that because the city was destroyed at the time, everything was burned, Luckily for us, all those clay tablets burned, and that's why they were preserved. And, uh, and now we have them, and they tell us about uh, 
this religion of the ancient Canaanites that we heard rumors about, we knew about uh, this religion by uh, what the Bible had to say about. But of course, what the Bible had to say about this religion is all negative. Now, the, the thought is the, the theory, or I would say the hypothesis, is that El and Baal, their attributes, their epithets, even some of their mythologies, their stories, merge into the figure of Yahweh by the time uh, people are writing the book of Joshua. That's more or less. Uh, Shaheen. Yeah, just to quickly follow on from that, um, I was just having a discussion today with a friend about the concept of holy envy. Holy envy? Mm -hmm. And it's basically, the idea is that you have a different tradition to yours. And there is something in this tradition that you admire or like, and you therefore find a way to incorporate it into your own tradition. That's the one side of holy envy. And so it sort of it would make sense that if there were like if there's this, you know, nomadic Yahweh mm. wind god, right? That starts out with some of the Canaanites, that for them to sort of concretize Make make him more concrete and sort of approachable in a sense is you take attributes that you like that you can relate to mm -hmm. and then just stick them on. That's it, holy envy, as called. Yeah, well, we definitely know that Yahweh was jealous. That's for sure. So maybe that's why he was jealous, because he. <laughs> Rudy. There was something I heard a long time ago. I don't remember where I heard it or how, uh, how much uh, uh, credibility there is to it, but, but there was a, there's a legend in the uh, Native uh, American uh, uh, peoples that there was a, a knight that was uh, extra long, that was exceptionally long, like where the sun on the other side of the world was standing still, so the knight here was extra long. And that's Sorry, could say that again? Because I could... That, that the... Uh, in the Native American people, there there is a there is a legend or a story that w once the, there was a night that was extra long, that was hours longer than the normal. The sun didn't rise. Oh. The sun was on the other side of the world that stood still. And I don't know how uh, whether that actually is a uh, story, but that that's what I heard a while ago. Yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting one. But yeah, there's there's a lot of stories like that, and these guys. Uh, of course, they thought it's the sun that goes around the earth, right? Uh, so when this guy, Baal, dies, and all the vegetation dies because he's the god of storm. So if he dies, there's no storm, there's no water, no crops. And it's the sun that has to go for a while to the underworld to find Baal and eventually bring him back to life. So yeah, those the, the ideas with the sun always uh, it's very interesting and appear in all, all sorts of mythologies I don't know if oh I see Karen back there hi Karen <laughs> and and Jean too I didn't see you guys all right uh, do we have any other questions it's already after nine so I don't know if not I will conclude this presentation and thank you very much for coming today in this very rainy day and thank you for watching. Thank you. What do we have next week? So next week is the Muslim perspectives on the Crusades, right? Yes. Next Tuesday. So thank you. Thank you, Urgen. Thank you.